Old Testament, you'll be able to discover that uh, Habakkuk was a prophet of God, but he functions in a way like a priest. I want you to appreciate the understanding between these two ministries that a prophet was a mouthpiece of God. He was sent by God from the throne room, God with a message to his people. On the other hand, a priest was a representative of man to God. And as a prophet got messages from God over to man, a priest got a message from man over to the Lord. And these two offices crisscrossed each other in the ministry between God for mankind. Habakkuk, however, though a prophet happens to function as a priest of sorts because he takes a message of concern from humanity over to God. In this dialogic style that he employs, he has a concern that he is taking over to God first and foremost before God could be able to respond and give him a message for his time and for the people. Prophet Habakkuk ministers at a time during the last days of the nation of Israel, at a time when the cloud of apostasy was so thick upon Israel that they were living in the very last days of the kingdom of Judah just before the Babylonian exile. And that time he comes to minister at a time when people are way far away from the Lord. But even though he functions in these two offices as a prophet and a priest, he has a message to the people. His concern, Habakkuk's concern, was that he sees the sinfulness of his people around. He sees the injustice, the bloodshed around. And then he comes over to God and poses a question to God that God, in your holiness, in your power and in your love, as a God of justice, as a God of righteousness, will you be able to look upon evil as evil escalates and yet you can do something about it? Lord, why don't you rein in the situation so that something can be done for your people that are called by your name? He moves over with his concern to the Lord and what we see happening thereafter is that God responds as he always does. Brothers and sisters, may I pause to ponder that however silly the question may be, however trivial the concern may be, but when a faithful child of God goes over to God seeking for an answer, taking over concern to God, God will always reign law and attend to our concern. And he goes over to ask God, how long, Lord? When will it be? And why, Lord? And as he poses that concern, we come over in chapter 1 and verse 5, and the Lord gives the first response. He tells him, yes, I see bloodshed. I see injustice. I see apostasy. But he says, look among the nations and watch. I'm reading verse 5, chapter 1. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though you were told. And it goes on to say, for I am rising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which will march through the breadth of the earth to possess the dwelling places, that are not even there. So he goes on to tell him. God comes and tells him, yes, you have seen your concerns. You've seen things troubling you. But he tells him, Mambo Bado, it is not here. What you're about to see is going to be worse than what is presently happening. And he tells him, I am going to do something on planet Earth 
end within Israel so that whoever looks at it and hears about it will not believe. For I am rising up a certain nation called the Chaldeans, and those are the Babylonians who are going to come and smash the city of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, and nothing will remain upon another. Habakkuk is confused even the more. He goes over to God in utter perplexity and tells him, God, According to the theology I know, and the plan that I know, will you as a faithful, loving God who called upon Israel to be your special people, will you use a foreign nation that are uncircumcised, that are not wholly called by you? Will you choose to use such a people as your instrument of justice upon your chosen people? Habakkuk is confused at how God operates. And friends, many times we do not understand God until after the passing of his activities. It was Job who said that I wish I had, I knew where to find you, I would come and present my cause before you. Many times, there are times when we get into certain situations, in some fix in life that we wish we had a meeting with God to ask him some questions over what is happening. And Habakkuk raises his concern over to God, but he raises this concern and then surrenders over to God. He says, I don't know what you're doing, but in verse one, chapter two, he says, but I will stand and watch and set myself on the rubber and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. The Lord comes and tells him in verse two, then the Lord answered and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he, may, he who runs may read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Brothers and sisters, you and I have been reading through the prophecies of the Bible, especially those of us who are Adventists and have been looking at Revelation timings in comparison with those of Revelation. Many of us have been thinking that the world is far off, and that we, many of us have been have been settled and comfortable in our different jobs, in our different routines. That's just within a few months from just last year when it happened from, I mean, from, from China. Within just about three months, the world has come to a standstill. It has come to a Sunday still, and uh, prophecy seems to be running towards this conclusion that though I don't believe that this is the very end, mark me, I am saying so. There are some pastors and prophets who are going around saying this is uh, one of the plagues that has come. I, I don't want to believe it. I, one thing that I believe is that this is a wake up call. It is a wake up call to you to know that God can cause this world to come to a stand, to a complete, halt, a complete standstill, even within a week. That even when He rises, so not even much can be an answer. Not even science can answer His intervention. The powerful presidents of the world are also perplexed, including your President Trump. He's guessing what is coming. He took this issue so, my, uh, so uh, as a minor issue, and it, it's, many of the president did so, and it's only when it has back on upon them that they realize it's bigger than it used it, it seemed to. And friends, power belongs to God, and it is Him who has led us to work. As he still gives us time to reconsider and look through, Habakkuk is here saying, 
I will stand and watch. And God is saying, my, my prophecy comes at the right time. It never tarries. It never delays. You may think it has delayed, but it has its timing for at the fullness of time, it will come to pass. Friends, when God talks to us, we should be able to understand. And then he comes to the message in chapter in verse in, in, in chapter two, where he comes and says, in verse four, he says, Behold the proud. His soul is not upright, but the just shall live by his faith. This is one of the most astounding statements, profound indeed in the entire Bible. The just shall live by faith. A theme that Paul picks in the see theology of the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. And what does this just shall live by faith mean? Habakkuk is here being told by God that the times that are coming are going to be so deadly, so trying, so unpredictable that anyone who will live within those times will need faith to be able to tag through. If there is any time that our faith needed to be at play, it is such a time as this when our jobs are uh, uncertain, when the economy is unsure, when we don't know even what is coming tomorrow, when our hopes are just dashing low. This is the time when Prophet Habakkuk was told to tell his people that at such a time as that, you will be able to need nothing but faith to tag through. And friends, like Judah, we are today faced with the utter confusion. When this coronavirus, COVID-19, had just started, uh, it was called a Chinese uh, thing, a Chinese virus. And people used to read upon it, about it, and they just would suspend it. It was there. It was there. Uh, some comedians even started to make fun of it. Jokes were being coined. I remember at one time it was also said that no, this is a disease of the whites. It doesn't affect the black man, that the black skin is too strong for it. We have now realized that it is even pulling from amongst our close relatives, friends, and within our houses. They used to tell us that it's a disease of the cold environment, like, uh, uh, <laughs> like, like, like you people, it's only a winter disease. It cannot come to Africa. I want to tell you that it is here in Uganda. It is in Kenya killing people and all over Africa where the environment is quite warm. For instance, the reality of the pandemic sinks in. We now realize and accept that it is real, that it's a global threat, that it kills, and it's not a mere fever, as conspiracy is also arising. As I've told you, presidents of the world are shaken and confused. Ordinary people don't know what is coming next, for tougher times are with us, and we don't know how tough it is going to even become tomorrow. World economies are crumbling and bowing down. Giant nations like your country are also bowing low for closed schools of closed. From kindergarten over to universities, they are now locked. Worship places have been closed down. The reason as to why we have we have started improvising so that we can reach one another from our homes. Well, churches have come back to the original entity of what it's supposed to be. I wish I had a mess, I had a time to talk to you about the home church, which is the best church. You know, many of us have been moving helter skelter, forgetting even our, the ministry to our homes. We've been so active in the bigger church, not knowing that we have a church at our homes six days of the week. But we have been coming home only to sleep, only to eat, only to rest and go home. That we have 
we have failed to realize that the most important church and ministry that is at home has been neglected. COVID-19 comes around to remind us that we need to go back to the best and count what is most important. Lectures have been cut off and now God is bringing us back to the root to realize what is more important, the needs away from the wants and the luxuries of life. The chest for the dollar can come to an end. I don't know whether it was true, but when it, has, it, it was reaching the peak in Italy, people were throwing money, it was shown as if they were throwing money to the streets. Because what is money when you are an offend later trying to catch your breath? When the lungs are stuffed up and you can't breathe and you know that the neighbors died and the other person is also gasping for breath, what is the use for money, even your bank accounts, however fat it may be? It's at such times as this that we need to come back and count our, uh, and try to, to do an introspection, an inventory of what is essential. What is it that counts ultimately? This coronavirus has locked us into our homes. As you know, all public transport has crumbled in many countries. As I speak now for us who are in Uganda and Kenya, we know it. Some of you are still moving because you are in some democracy and that's sometimes I think how, why you are dying. Some of us have been locked completely home. I can't drive my car out. When I do, I, we, there, there's a roadblock that asks me where I am going. We've been locked at home for the last three weeks intact now. No movement apart from within your compound. Some of you can get stickers, can get permits for an hour, or you can even go to work. Time may come, as it has come upon us, that you cannot move out. For well, that is happening in many places. You go airports. Planes have parked. The highways and motorways are empty. Towns have started to become ghost towns and cities. Sports and games, the soccer and all those you've been hearing over no more for stadiums are empty. Hotels and, 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 uh, and restaurants are also empty in many countries. It is believed that uh, over half of the of the globe are at home. Over half have been locked at home with restrictions here and there. Some parliaments are no longer sitting. And so this is the situation we are in, that we are in some form of panic and confused. But Habakkuk is coming with a message and telling us that uh, it may even be worse, mambo bad. It's not yet. It may be worse than what you've seen so far. But in the midst of this escalation, in the midst of this uncertainty, what is the message that God has for us? The message is first captured in that verse, where it is said, the just shall live by faith. God's people, I want to tell you that the faith makes us look up. Faith is nothing but that belief which, when all has come to a standstill, when you cannot reason logically out, is when you can look up to God and know that though I may be crying and I may not know how the day will end, but I know who holds the end of this day and who reigns in the tomorrow. That's our only confidence, knowing that though all things may happen around us, even when death shall knock at our doors, we can in confidence say, I know whom I believe. We can in confidence, even at the brink, at, at the very end of death of life, we can even say like the Apostle Paul that yes, death has come, but though I know that I'm going to die, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have run the course of the rest. Knowing that though I rest, I await my savior to come. Like Job said, that I know my Redeemer liveth. This, that's the faith that we require in the midst of all. But those that are called by his name, the just, 
shall live by faith, we shall come yet and go through the darkness that surround us. That we can, even when we are crying and we are in pain, we can be able to sustain the hope that this is not the end. God will finally reign through. For we know, as also Solomon told us, there's no permanent situation. Even coronavirus will come to an end. Even this situation will end. But the question is, how will it end? Friends, whenever God looks at human beings, whom he created in his image and his likeness, whenever God looks at human beings that he sent Christ to die for his only son, whenever God looks at us who are created in his image and likeness, who have the coast of his son's blood, so precious, whenever he looks upon us going wayward in atrocities in sin and committing all sorts of evil, whenever God looks at that situation, there is no way God can love us so and allow us to perish forever without warning and wake up calls. These are wake up calls. They are beckons that tell us that God is interested in our attention. Some of us have been even going to church, but not worshiping at church, leave alone the home issue that I've talked about. Some of us have been hard, even that we've been benumbed to even the call of God, that even when we have gone to church, we've gone there as a duty and a formality. We go there maybe to sing a special item, and we practice and go and sing. Some of us may go there only to preach a sermon and come up. That is the duty and preach to others. Some of us have been just attending, just to be counted that we were there. When we are in church, we're thinking about our next job and shift and so that we may go home and sleep as we are going to work in the evening. We've been so hard to listen to God's call. And such times as these come, that God will not allow us, but he wake, awakens our consciousness our attention and the calls upon us. In the Bible, God did speak to our forefathers many times during such times as those when they had gone away from him and wayward. He could be able to speak and break on them in various ways. He could send locusts. Those of you who have been reading, locusts had invaded us in Kenya and in Uganda, all over these places. Those are wake up calls. Immediately after locusts subsided, Corona rose up. Those are wake up calls. And when you go over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, from verse 15 downwards, you'll be able to read about God saying, if you will not heed my call, these things will happen upon you. Now, I'm not a prophet of doom. And um, the question that possibly could be ringing in your mind is, is God responsible for all these calamities that are coming? Pastor, is it God who has sent this coronavirus? Are we, are we suffering because of, of, of God? Is, is God responsible? This is not an easy question to address. For various people have addressed it variously. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible is clear that it's only in the Lord's presence where there is peace prosperity, and blessings. Whatever we have is because of God. But whenever we move away from God, whenever we move away from his presence, whenever we move away from his reign, this is a world of sin. And what we are out to reign, to reap, and to receive is nothing but the challenges of this world. This world is being preserved because there is a shadow of God hovering upon us. And whenever that curtain is drawn apart, whenever his presence is drawn aside, whenever we go away from his presence, what meets us is but calamity and the evil that this world brings. God is simply calling upon you and me that we may be able to come back in his arms of safety because that is where you belong. That is where I belong.
at such a time as this when we have started falling sick, when we don't know who the next victim will be, at such a time as this when we are fighting with an invisible enemy which we can't see with our eyes, a disease which you, you may even be having now on your clothes or somewhere, but which has not even started to show signs. A disease which can take us anytime. When you're fighting an invisible enemy, you need to do your part, but knowing that though we may keep ourselves, the ultimate keeper is God. Friends, I want you to take your hygiene seriously. I want you to take your, 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 your precautions seriously. But the truth of the matter is, as the psalmist says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake throughout the night in vain. The truth of the matter is we can do our part, but the greatest part and finality of it all is in the hands of the Lord. As you go about all business, I want you to know that it's only under the shelf of his arms that we will find solace. It is him alone who can keep us. It is him alone who is even the ultimate healer. For truth be said, there is no cure. There is no medicine proper for this illness. It is only God who can shine his face upon us. In the midst of this, the message that I want to leave with you is that message in the verse that we have read. In the midst of such atrocities, in such calamity, fighting an invisible enemy. By the way, it's a small virus which we can't see or touch properly and so we have it. <laughs> so small, so minute, but one that is bringing the entire world to a standstill. But in the midst of such a threat, in the midst of such uncertainty, in the midst of such devastation, in the midst of such fear and panic, Habakkuk is told by God, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. What does it mean? The Lord reigns. What does it mean? The Lord is in control. What does it mean? It simply tells us that though you may see as if the world is running berserk, as if nothing's coming to avail, as if the future is hopeless, the truth of the matter is God is in control, he is ruling, and he knows even the tomorrow, and everything is in his hand, secure and proper, that it's only him we should put our trust in. And that gives me assurance. And I can speak like the psalmist says, that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil when God is with me. I want to encourage you. It may be worse, but let that comfort be with you. That though you walk through the valley of the shadow of corona, we shall fear no corona. For when God is with us, who can be against us? It's the confidence and the smile that I want to, to, to leave with you. That even in the face of the threat, even in the face of the threat of the illness, even in the face of the threat of death, we shall fear no evil when the Lord is with us. And when all is said and done and it, have, it will have subsided, we will be able to present our households before the Lord, knowing that he has been with us and he is with us. I want to leave with you some few promises. First of all, in the book of, in the book of Psalm, and I want to read some verse with you to encourage you as I leave you to celebrate this Sabbath, knowing that Corona shall not scare us because the Lord, is with us. Psalm 46 and verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. Though its waters roll and be troubled, 
though the mountain shake with its dwelling, we will not be afraid because the Lord is our refuge and strength, even in times of trouble. I want to encourage someone who is sick and listening to me. The Lord is our healer. For Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, Exodus 15, 26, encourages those who are troubled at this time. And it says, if you diligently hear the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what's right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes. I'll put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians. But the last phrase, for I am the Lord who heals you. I want to encourage those of you who are sick that we have a refuge in the Lord. But above all, we have a healer in the Lord our God. It is possible, friends, that God can be able to heal you. And it's my prayer even now that as we stretch his hand in prayer, our hands in prayer, his hand will come and touch you unto wellness. That we will be spared because not of our being so careful, not because our immunity is so strong, but because the Lord is with us. And ultimately, he is our leader. Psalm 18, 22 has this to tell us as well. I'm just giving you promises of encouragement. 18.2, it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. And then 27, the same book, Verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, and he shall set me high upon a rock. Friends, the many promises that God has given us as our solace for confidence to go through during this time. However, I want to read with you my popular psalm that I have quoted before, and that is Psalm 23. I am reading verse 1 to 6, but I want your attention to 0 on verse 4. But verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your road and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. It is my prayer, brothers and sisters listening to me and watching. Uh, thank you, Pastor, and uh, I'll invite Brother Martin. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Have a thread with us. It's so uncertain that we do not know what tomorrow holds. But one thing is clear, that we know who holds tomorrow. One thing is clear, that the Lord is with us. It's my prayer that you will be comforted in the truth of the fact that God is with you. As a house, as a father, as a mother's parents, call upon the Lord your God, that even during times as these, the blood of Jesus will be upon your house that the angel of death, that this coronavirus will pass over you. And when all is said and done, we'll say glory to the Lord. We are spared not because we were careful, 
We are spared not because we were stronger than those that left us, but we were spared. Glory to God. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you that you could give us a moment such as this to meditate upon your word as we also <clears throat> remind ourselves of your servant Habakkuk. You gave him a message at the close of the times of Judah that, Lord, the situation was going to escalate, but even in the midst of all, the faithful ones would go through. You also assured him that you are still on the throne, that you are in control. And, Lord, we want to put our faith in you. That though the situation escalates, though even tomorrow it will be, it will be worse than what it is, may we fear no evil when you are with us. Carry us through, Lord, and encourage us that we will put our faith in you and encourage ourselves and that as people see us so confident and so happy in you, they'll be able to ask the secret that lies behind, the secret that informs our hope and smile and optimism, and we will point them no our strength, our comfort, our healer, and our Alpha and Omega. I pray for your sons and daughters who are sick, and the Lord, you will heal them in the name of the Lord. I pray for those who are still strong and healthy. I pray that may you put a hedge around them, that none of these threats will come closer to them, their household, and their loved ones. I pray for your church, Lord, that you preserve us, that we may have a story to tell, a testimony to tell to the world that there's a healer in Jerusalem. Father, we pray that we continue to be with your sons and daughters as they carry on with the Sabbath hours. To you be glory now and forevermore. For we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you for me. Thank you. Amen. Martin, you can give us the final remarks. Okay, good morning, everyone. I just want to say I'm thankful to God for his goodness to the entire children of him, we the Samaritans included. First of all, I want to take this time to thank Pastor Maka for accepting to be with us today. Uh, may God continue to use you mightily for the glory and honor of his holy name and that you will continue to minister to his children around the world whenever you are called upon. May his spirit continue to guide you and your household that his name shall